morning, everyone. It's September 17th, 2021. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Gillowitz and our friend Mike Boland. It's This Week in XR. Mike, thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I'm a big fan of the show. Well, Mike, as uh, some of the listeners may know, uh, also uh, republishes this column uh, with some um, classy editing in the AR Insider, uh, where Mike is the uh, principal analyst and uh, actually actually principal everything. Um, but uh, he runs a fantastic consultancy. Uh, he's a former journalist who knows uh, probably more about this business than I will ever learn and uh, has been a, a great friend and a resource for me uh, as I have become uh, an expert over the past six years. So uh, not a big news week this week, you guys. Lots of small, interesting stories. So Mike, let's start with your work and, and what's going on uh, in the industry and, uh, and what you're involved with these days. Sure. So uh, like you said, I run a uh, sort of research and insights firm called Artillery Intelligence, sort of connected at the hip to that is our uh, publication, AR Insider. Uh, and that's where we sort of republish your column. And and credit to you, we, we do very little editing, actually. Most of it is sort of formatting and making it look pretty because, um, um, well, I, I won't talk about Forbes' uh, sort of aesthetics. Um, but yeah. And, well, anyway, we can't use, we can't use the, the, the wire photos that Forbes gives. Uh... Yeah. Oh, oh, and, and rightly so. I mean, those those are protected. Yeah. Anyway, um, no, I'm, I'm actually uh, I say that in jest. I used to I used to be a reporter for Forbes many, many years ago. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, I won't go into eat up all our time and like all the things I'm doing and seeing. But the, the sort of coverage focus of the last month or so has been a lot of metaverse stuff, obviously, yeah. sort of helping everyone define it and it's such a sort of theoretical construct at this point of course but you know it's it's interesting um very overused as a buzzword but interesting and then and then besides that uh, some of our research around sizing the market for ar glasses speculating on what apple's going to do sort of sleuthing around on the supply chain uh facebook's uh ray-ban uh stories how that sort of fits into this model of what we're calling light ar i got um, mine nice no, oh, yeah, that's, that's me. So people can decide if I look normal or not. Yeah, pretty normal. They look they pretty look natural. Like right yeah. These are these are my Bose frames. Do I look less normal with Bose frames on? Not the same, you know. Yeah, they're a little more blocky. Yeah. They're blockier. But, they're you know, as we were... a little heavier. Yeah, they're yeah. Blocky, a little blockier. But that's an, that's an earlier version. Yeah, the, the current version I have look more like those yeah. in the... Apple but the Ray Bans look like Ravens. That's that's kind of their key advantage is they really look like Ravens. It's also their potential concern is that they look so much like normal sunglasses with active yeah. cameras and a little light that lights up. But you know, I mean it's all it's all part of the 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 journey to the future is these concerns about the ethics and how do we yeah. grapple with them, right? That's exactly right, I think. Um, you know, I'm calling it training wheels for AR glasses to sort of acclimate the world culturally because they have two major sort of challenges. One is technological. And of course, there is this, you know, sort of design dilemma of do you go graphics heavy but bulky like a Magic Leap 1 type device? Or do you go the other end of the spectrum where it's very light AR, but people will actually wear them? And I think like, you know, there are pros and cons of both. There's a sliding scale in the middle. But that sort of wearability priority from like a design perspective is interesting because, you know, they realize this is a long game and what they need to do first is to get the world sort of acclimated and comfortable with wearing face worn tech so that when we do get to the point where both of those things are possible, which is probably 10 years away, you know, Magic Leap style graphical intensity with in a pair of Ray-Bans, by the time we get there, if they kind of work that cultural piece at least, you know, those those glasses will have a softer landing, not a not a Google Glass type landing. Yeah, we, we largely agree with that. I mean, if you think about pocket computing as the ubiquitous form of most people's compute day in, in yeah. some fashion, um, the steps that it took, you know, with BlackBerry and then all the different devices that added pocket compute functionality to the point where you then had this kind of, you know, holy grail moments of the iPhone and then the, the really... Um, sort of evolved Android phones that really kind of made the ecosystem what it was and took it to massive scale. I think it's a very strong parallel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and plus the idea that, and I think the three of us agree very strongly about this, 
there will not just be one wearable augmented reality, mixed reality device for the different purposes that we use these devices for. There's gonna be heavier weight, heavier compute, heavier design oriented devices, and then lighter weight, light touch wearables that will have a different price category, a different use category that we'll find different uses for. Just like, you know, we use a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone and other types of compute today. Yeah, um, I and think you, mentioned the, you mentioned the key word, which is gradual. That, that pr process is always gradual, as you guys know. And, and with your example of the evolution of the smartphone, remember how long it took for people to sort of, or a lot of certain segment of people to get used to, um, not capacitive touch, but, but I guess a virtual keyboard is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Well, Getting people <clears throat> the keys. You remember when Barack Obama was elected, one of the issues was that he was so addicted to his Blackberry. Blackberry. Yeah. <laughs> and people loved the elevated keyboard and the feel of the Blackberry, mm -hmm. even though it had a very little tiny, tiny screen, even compared to the early iPhones, which also had relatively small screens. Mm -hmm. And it so took some transition period, probably four or five years before pretty much everybody had switched to smartphones. Yeah, yeah. That think, wasn't think, that long ago. <laughs> I think the three of us are also, we've been around long enough to know there's a lot of give to get moments in technological evolution, right? Yeah. So like for me uh, on my BlackBerry Pearl, which is still one of my favorite devices that I've used, there was a very, very advanced predictive typing so that the screen was, you know, a tiny little screen. Much better it, than Apple's. But it started to build out these words and you could really type really quickly on it. And really it wasn't until I started to, you know, multiple iPhones in, really get the voice to text, voice to type to really, really work. And I'm a big voice type on my phone. So I talk into it all the time. What's that? So are all old people. Yeah, old people. Are old. <laughs> well, it's, it's amazing. BlackBerry, or I guess Rim, had more brand loyalty than like so many other companies that you often point to. I mean, an example is when we're you know watching TV and maybe it's like a movie from the 2000s or something, or they're trying to date the movie and it's, you know, you know, a period detail and someone's got a BlackBerry. She always looks at it very nostalgically and says, oh man, I loved my BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. It's actually so weird to watch a movie from the 80s now because nobody has smartphones and often the tension of the movie is that you can't get in touch with anybody else. Yeah. Well, I, I, I this weird psychological principle, we always kind of project the current technology on our memories. Mm -hmm. And I always think like when I was in college, there was no, no some, any smartphone, not even flip phones. All It was a period before that where it wasn't ubiquitous yet. And it was right on the cusp of that. But, you know, how did we all, you know, pull off social engagement, meeting at the right place That's at the right time? My daughter off has asked me that question several times. And the answer was, you used the telephone. Yeah, you made a phone call. And then, or if you, you said you were going to be somewhere, you were there. One time. Yeah. It, it's funny because I, I say, you used the original metaverse, which was the telephone. There you go. <laughs> You know, one thing about the metaverse that I've been thinking about lately, and, and I actually said it in my editorial this morning, is that it's not like the internet goes away and it's replaced by another thing. Right. It is the web. or right. It's not the web. exactly like, it's not like all of our cars are going to go away and we're all driving Teslas tomorrow, right? Yeah. The old world and the new world interact and live side by side for quite a long time with most things, like for a decade or so before there's a full transition. And I fully expect, first of all, I don't think we're really going to know when we're in the metaverse. There's not going to be a party. There's not a finish line that says you're no longer in the internet. Now you're in the metaverse. But I think what will happen over time is that the metaverse will contain the internet. The internet will be part of the metaverse, so to yeah. speak. So well, it's really, versa. I don't think it's a replacement of what we have so much as an expansion of it. Yeah. And, and an expansion of its borders, right? Well, not, not only an expansion, but I think if we look at the web, it's the right model because I think everyone's trying to put their finger on what the metaverse will be. And a lot of people are afraid that it'll be like, you know, the Oasis from Ready Player One and that one company will own it, whether that be <clears> Facebook <throat> or someone else. When we look at the web, no one owns the web. It is interoperable. It allows for several fiefdoms and walled gardens, and we can go from place to place. But that's because we have, well, one, the browser, which was really what unlocked all that. But two, 
you know, common standards and protocols. We have HTTPS, right. common languages, HTML, and, you know, these sort of governing bodies that, you know, or everyone's agreed that these are going to be common standards. So it allows for the proprietary nature of, you know, seeking business models on the internet, but yet it's still interoperable. I think some version of that or some, you know, high level version of that formula could answer a lot of questions that people are asking of, you know, will it be one metaverse? Will it be several? Will Facebook own the whole thing? I think, you know, maybe I'm over or underthinking it. Maybe I'm making it too simplistic, but if we look at the web as a model, I think there's a lot there. Well, let's, let's be clear about one thing. It's not based on headsets. If it's based oh, on headsets, yeah. it's over before it began. Now, yeah. headsets have penetration like consoles. You know, maybe you have something developing just for headsets. Yeah. But you know, it, again, it's in the teens, the, the million teens, like the 15, the what, eight digit, eight digit sum range. You know, it's it's like 15, 15 million yeah. as an installed base right now, where if you look at smartphones, that's what, 300 million right. um, in the U.S. It's, it's or or consoles, million. which are 175 million. Yeah. Well, and Charlie, see if you agree with this. Mike and I were on a, on a, a conference early this week, and I was trying to sort of make this point about... Um, things that were in the physical world, physical goods, physical services, turning into virtual services. And I'm sure the three of us, you guys are super smart. You can tick off things really quickly, right? Physical books into e-readers to the Kindle, right? When was the last time you letters. sent a physical- Letters. Letters, right. When was the last time you sent a physical paper fax as opposed to opening up your tablet and e-signing something and sending it on? We can find these metaphors over and over and over again that are basically turning things that we had to do physically into some sort of virtual teleportation dynamic. And the next step of the metaverse is we're building avatars of ourselves and we're traveling less for business because of the pandemic and even just because of the nature of the way we can do work today and the advancement of very, very easy, low cost, high quality video chat. Uh, and then you put in the layer of virtual reality and mixed reality headsets as a subset of that, as a sector of that for the more advanced people, you have, we have already built the metaverse. We have built it over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and now it's really starting to blossom with these highly graphical interfaces and tool sets that essentially most of the planet has, right? We've removed any of the kind of like elitism of it. Everybody can be in the metaverse and, and they are. Um, so it's a very interesting topic to study from that perspective, from that sort of Look at all the things we do just sitting in our homes now that we had to go out of the home to do. And that is the metaverse, right? Largely the metaverse. And I think the business opportunity is looking for, and this is of course hindsight's 2020, but looking for those, those next things that will make that transfer and owning a piece of that sort of value chain. Like for example, DocuSign would, would fit into the, Perfect the, example. the analog that, that you just made. And of course there are several others, but you know, um, but that's interesting. You also mentioned avatars. I think, you know, we could talk forever about that, but I think that's another sort of scheme for a lot of people of identity and sort of personal, you know, um, you know, the accoutrement that sort of define yourself within or render yourself within this. And there I go back to the, you know, the same thing about, you know, will it be like the web? So for example, right now we have emojis, right? and they are sort of decided every year by the Unicode consortium, right? And they put those out and it's basically HTML code that any browser will recognize or any messaging app. So if you're in Gmail or if you're in, you know, uh, WhatsApp, if you're in iMessage, that um, emoji is going to be rendered the way it was supposed to. Now it'll be slightly stylistically different as we yeah. know, like if you're in Gmail, they have different CSS that renders that different than I mean, iMessage. There are some awkward on. transitions. But, you can't go from iPhone yeah. to for example. But if if and, we have, if you stick with me just for, I'll stop rambling in a second. If we have a situation that is at least high level like that, where there is some sort of, you know, registry, central registry, maybe it's ICANN, maybe instead of websites in the metaverse, you're registering yourself in the way you look. That renders differently if you're in a game or an experience that's based on Unreal Engine, uh, because they have a certain rendering of their, their code and their style. But then if you jump over to say Minecraft, which is the opposite, it's very blocky, the basics of your look and feel are the same, but it can sort of adapt stylistically to some of these fiefdoms. Yeah, I largely agree with that. It's, you're talking about the, the, the goal set of interoperability, right? Yeah. 
Email exactly. is interoperable. The web is interoperable. We can open up most browsers, most modern browsers, and get to the same website. It may look slightly different, and some things won't be supported, right? People say, this only works in Chrome, this only works in Firefox. But for the most part, most things work. And I think that is the, the decided goal set of a lot of companies is to make it interoperable. But it does conflict with the walled garden concept of how do you credential in? And who owns your credential, right? So it's a big, it's a big ethical conundrum that we're well, there, doing. Yeah, all these players are going to have to like play nice together to form those standards of interoperability. That's one of the barriers. But well, sorry, I think sorry. that's one of the advantages you have when you're um, Epic Games is that you own Unreal Engine, yep. where half the content is built upon. And so, <clears throat> for example, they could integrate meta humans as the avatar system, and you just enable it with a click. Yep. Because in terms of building virtual worlds, avatar systems are the hardest. And avatar systems, I think, as we've learned over the past 10 years, are also among the most important. Mm -hmm. I would go one step further. Something we haven't talked about uh, is anonymity and personal identity. Yep. Uh, one of the things that has made the internet so pernicious and dangerous is anonymity, where people can behave like naked apes who are not part of a real society with no consequences. If you behave that way in the supermarket, you would be kicked out. You wouldn't be allowed to participate in the commerce that allows us to eat. So I, I think, yes, I mean, look, I mean, I get it, you know, government control, blah, blah, blah. But the alternative to government control is anarchy. You know, it's a world filled with criminals who can steal at will. I mean, is that because that's where it yeah. goes? That is the logical endpoint of anonymity: is that the wrong kind of actors will have power. Now, you may not like the current gatekeepers, but imagine a world without them, because I think we've gotten a good taste of that on the internet, and it's created a world filled with dangerous conspiracy theories and anti-democratic sentiment. And so, you have to imagine a more immersive world that would be even more influential and even more dangerous. So I know people hate this idea of Facebook insisting that you have one identity in their VR ecosystem. And perhaps for many people, that's a reason to um, reject it. But in my case, I think it's, I applaud Facebook. I think it's a reason to celebrate because at least they seem to be recognizing what has gone wrong with the internet. And again, I don't blame that on Facebook. They could have made different decisions, but they're human and they're trying to make money. They're no different than you and I. Any of us could be working there, making those same damning decisions about artificial intelligence and how to better market things. But it's all just about being American and making money. It's not, you know, a treasonous thing. The problem, and therein lies the problem. They can't imagine how else it can be used. <laughs> yeah. And that is always the great thing about sociopaths and bad guys. They're really good at thinking of things that we're not going to think of and yeah. that our friends or the people at Facebook are not going to think of either because they're normal and they're not bad. They're motivated by things we understand. Whereas well, you know, people just... peddling conspiracy theories, I don't understand that at all. Right. I don't understand What is the governing goal of the modern Republican Party? Where is the debate? The debate seems to be democracy or not democracy. You know, the debate seems to be an activist government or not an activist government. If we take this to our little XR sector that we're all deeply in, and you look at the social instances of VR and, and now some in MR, there is a strong goal of code of conduct, right? Um, and because it's a smaller subset and a smaller universe and a smaller group of people, the idea of building these codes of conduct and understanding that we're entering a potentially even more dangerous instance of the World Wide Web than the public internet on two-dimensional devices. You're going into spatial devices and spatial worlds that start to feel more real. At least someone is tacking into code of conduct. Here's a place to report when people are doing bad things. We can kick them off the platform. You know, yes, they could re-sign in as another another avatar, you know, open up another Gmail account and we sign in. But at least you're making an effort to say that, you know, we need to be respectful and these are the general codes of conduct. And, and, have to give them and at least you erect some obstacles to being bad. Correct. Again, real bad guys are going to find a way.
I don't mm. deny that. But you have all sorts of casual people behaving badly who wouldn't go to that trouble, who aren't technologically sophisticated enough, who aren't going to take the time and effort to set up a new avatar and a new identity because it has to be hard. Right. So one thing I never realized about Facebook until um, you were just uh, talking about it, Charlie, is they obviously have a lot of flack um, over their sort of decisions over the last five years, some of all of the privacy stuff. We won't beat that dead horse. Um, and, and, and a lot of the flack is deserved. Um, but it's interesting. I think people often forget that they were the ones who initially sort of brought in that paradigm of identity um, to the web. Um, because before that, it was that Wild West you know, anonymity, um, you know, where bad actors thrive sort of environment. And it, it still is to some degree, but Facebook sort of corner of the universe had based that on you are your real identity. Um, and that's not even the case on some other social networks. I mean, it's, it's against Facebook terms of service to, you know, a lot of people do this and they don't really enforce it, but sign up like as your dog. Um, but, you know, well, in, of course, in other social internet, networks, no one knows. Yeah. <laughs> and on, on Twitter, you can sign up as whatever you want, whatever name, whatever bot, you know, uh, you know, things like that, where, where Facebook has always held to this. You are your real identity. That's our terms of service. Great. That's great. So, you know, interesting, you know, Facebook, every time they do something, including introducing, you know, a, a, a not very functional smart glasses uh, is bombarded with criticism for everything they do. And it, much of it is undeserved, but I think what it shows you that I agree. Is true in your personal relationship is also true in a business relationship that once you lose somebody's trust, let's say by having an affair, once you lose that trust, it is extremely extremely difficult to earn that trust back yeah and and obviously facebook is nowhere near doing that um, well a small version of that is what the sort of xr space has gone through in the last five years because in the sort of 2016 17 hype cycle where it was just touted as this like world changing thing i think we lost a lot of trust of consumers of sort of other tech sectors that this is going to this impending you know, world shifting thing. And I think we've we've lost a lot of trust for that as an industry. Uh, mm. It's a small version of what you're talking about. It's going to be hard to get that back. Well, there's no question that in 2016, VR was overpromised. Uh, yeah. Part of it was the excitement around the acquisition of Oculus and the promise that Facebook made and kept to invest billions of dollars to developing the medium. So I'm glad all that hype was there. That what, that's what caused me to quit my high paying analyst job and start start a new one and focused on all this stuff. And it's been a blast ever since. So so, you know, 2016 was was a year where a lot of promises were made in 2017 and 2018. The promises were not delivered upon. The Oculus Go yeah. was a promise not delivered upon. And I, I mean, I get why they did it. And I'm sure they lost a ton of money on the go, as I'm sure they're going to lose a lot of money on Ray-Ban stories. But the learning that they got from putting out that lame headset and losing that money guided them through yeah. the launch of the Oculus Quest, which, in my opinion, has been a huge success. I don't know that it's working oh, out yeah. economically for them, but the path is now that they have set out the path and they are now on it. And you know, clearly they're was subsidizing software companies all over the place making a million dollars from the Oculus store, which granted is kind of a joke in the console world. Like you make a million dollars in the console world, you're fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had, this sort you know, of um the PR calculus around that, like not setting the wrong expectations. I think they've internalized that because I've plucked out a few pieces and we did an article on this where we just sort of um these, these very similar sounding statements in, in sort of public venues or on earnings calls from Evan Spiegel, both Evan Spiegel and Mark Zuckerberg, where they're both now being more, I guess, communicative. They, they weren't hiding it before, but maybe they weren't as communicative that all these things we're talking about, you know, the, the Ray-Bans that have full AR, that's going to be like a 20s, 2030s reality, not, not a 2020s reality. And I think that they've, they've learned the lesson to sort of manage expectations. Yeah. Um, and some of those expectations are people like us and our imaginations going wild and writing about it, which is fine. That's good. But um, so I think that they've, they've been a little more careful from a PR I perspective. What, they, to, what we all missed in 20, um, what, what we all missed in 2016, of course, was the cost, complexity, and difficulty of using gaming PCs. And if you weren't already 
using a gaming PC, getting it's like it to a $2,000 investment. There was going to be a lot of friction and a lot of investment. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of the VR winter uh, came about because that was the realization that PC VR was not going to scale. Yeah. yeah. And Ocul or sorry, Ted, you first, sorry. I was just going to say, like, listening to you guys talk, uh, it just reminds me of the last now six, seven years of my life. In every presentation I would give, I would be essentially explaining to people the long level of trajectory that these things have to get to success. And that all of these things that you feel like are going to just happen tomorrow are not going to happen tomorrow. There'll be a subset of hyper users, you know, we call them early adopters, but they're really more than early adopters. They're people that are vested in this, either from a, a working standpoint, a career standpoint, or just unbelievably enthusiastic to the point that they're willing to put huge amounts of time and effort into like dealing with all the friction, right? Um, and that's what makes things very small scale. And then as you chip away at those friction points, you start to find scale and you start to find usability. And we can, again, track this to every other form of compute. This is not any different than, you know, when Steve Jobs left Apple and then started the next computing system and people sort of kind of have forgotten what all that was and how important that was. But, you know, even though the next computer wasn't a successful computer, it set the trajectory for effect effectively Pixar. all future computers that we use today, right? The way that we use them in the design concepts and how they work as an operating system. And the same thing is happening with virtual reality and even more so with mixed reality. So when you bring the point up of a true mixed reality device, not these kind of early adopter phases of it, um, is more like the 2030 uh, situation. And I've always talked about this 10 year gap when we're looking at 2020 to 2030. Well, well, let's, let's use an example we both lived through, which is one of the most successful consumer electronics uh, stories is the story of the Sony PlayStation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, in 1995, I was working for a software company before I went to AOL, a game company. And, you know, Sony was like coming in, <laughs> making a presentation like we just lost a billion dollars building this piece of technology. And now we need people to make software for it. And by the way, we get 50%. Classic loss leader. And, and it took them to get to 100 million devices 15 years. Yep. But Ted is absolutely right in his 10-year-ish um, standard. And now, of course, look at the size of that business. Of course, it's their biggest profit center, right? Yeah. So, and you know, there, there's lots of like, I'm sure you guys and for our listeners, Console Wars is a great book to read. And there's a fantastic few book about that was the early days when we're talking about N64, mm -hmm. and the original Sega Genesis. Um, and that was, you know, the early 90s. And that was a really uh, big deal in the business. And it set, it set uh, Sony on its path and um, also set unfortunately, uh, Sega on its path uh, to basic irrelevance uh, because it became, it became a duopoly between Sony and Xbox and, and Sega is still making- They make games still. Evidence. Yeah. Now I'm um, tying this back to Facebook though. I find this interesting because, you know, they're students of history, they're smart people. Yep. They're seeing all of these lessons and they're investing in all of these lost leaders. I mean, the Oculus Quest 2 is a lost leader. Oh, huge. We, don't, we don't know the unit economics, but they're, they're not making, you know, a lot or, or anything. Right on each unit. They ain't good, they right? Want to, yeah. They want to get that flywheel spinning. They're also students of network effect because right. of their core business, but yeah. yeah, they want to get that flywheel spinning. And, and I think back to like, I feel like the thumbnail for this episode could be like the, the Facebook apologist. Com uh, committee. Um, <laughs> I think back to like giving them some credit where it's due. They're investing so much and it is in a self-interested way, but the byproduct of that is they're jumpstarting an ecosystem. As you mentioned, Charlie, all these smaller game studios are making millions of dollars. And so they're, they're planting seeds for that very long game. The, the, you know, the same thing you guys were just talking about. Right. Yeah. It's a, a really interesting topic. I mean, we're yeah, really I mean, Facebook, you know, a lot of things can happen along the way. Facebook could be broken up. Google could be broken up and one could make a very good argument for that, uh, for the good of the long-term good of the industry and for the long-term good of the economy. It, it might be better for everyone if Instagram and YouTube were separate companies on their own. Uh, as a shareholder in both Google and Facebook, I would be pretty happy with that because I think yeah. just like AT&T broken up, great, I have two unbelievably valuable internet companies. Yeah. 
rather than one media. Up. Then let me just make one more point about our discussion about Facebook. Um, yes, I am a fan of Mark Zuckerberg's. I am not a supporter of him running the world, however. I want the person who runs the world to be accountable to me as a voter. In this teeny tiny way, we'd have a choice about having a giant dog climb on us while we're trying to talk, get off me. Uh, you know, we would have a choice about who rules us. You know, and as this metaverse that we are in the process of building becomes more and more of an important place where people spend their time, I think it'll be more critical to introduce, you know, we were talking about standards and codes of conduct. You know, these are things that should be made with our input, not based on the fiat of one man. And so although Zuckerberg is clearly not a bad guy and he's trying to find a balanced and transparent way to wield this power, why is one man wielding this power? Like if we had all thought in the year 2000, somebody would be this powerful, we would have laughed, right? Because it wouldn't be, have been conceivable. Yeah. And by the way, Facebook, no outside directors, a different class of stock that Mark Zuckerberg owns. You know, he is the king of Facebook and cannot be deposed. Yeah, and he's built that moat pretty deftly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a brilliant guy. He's um, he, he's done amazing things. He's deservedly one of the richest men in the world. That doesn't mean he's the boss of me. Yeah, good point. So I, I think Facebook is going to continue to operate uh, in an air of distrust, um, partly just because of its unchecked power. And so I don't do think it's wrong for people to distrust that. Yep. Do you guys think that it's still the, you don't like it change the channel concept still holds or do you think we're past that? So you're making this point about you don't want X, Y, and Z out of Facebook, right? Um, can you just choose then to say, I'm no longer going to use that platform. I'm no longer going to be part of that community. Is that your ultimate power? Because Ultimately, that is the ultimate and only true consumer power is when a consumer doesn't like what a company does, you choose to not engage with that company, right? And then, or, or you only choose to engage with parts of that company. Um, and I'm just curious if you guys think that way, because I think that way about a lot of companies that, okay. I, that I interface things there. Do we think Facebook is a monopoly? Do we think, I mean, the problem is if you don't use a Facebook product, you pay a personal and perhaps a economic penalty. So in that sense, yes, I think it has passed that point. You can't leave Facebook and easily replace it with other social media platforms. Economically, are they a monopoly? Well, that's kind of a, a difficult question with all these free services, right? I mean, so <clears throat> I, I think it is, uh, certainly that is the argument that Facebook would make to it being broken up is we're not a monopoly. There's lots of competition. Um, there is no reason in law to dismantle Facebook. Google would argue the same thing. I guess I just adhere to the don't like it, don't use it uh, concept. No, now that's not perfect. I, I don't think I use Facebook very much anymore. I agree with you and Facebook sort of didn't see this coming, but they saw something coming by being students of what happened to MySpace, where it's this herd mentality of the social graph. And what they did is they built sort of strong roots around their business by not just having it be a social graph, but being that identity layer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Facebook Connect and, and you know, single sign-on, stuff like all of those other little things were these little tentacles that they were planting to make it harder for people to, to make that decision to walk away. Right. But, but I completely agree with you. I think there's a, there's a lot of whining and it's like, you know, there is a certain degree of that. You don't like it, change the channel. I, I love that. Well, that's about all the time we've had. We've been blabbing for a little more than 35 minutes and obviously we could go on for days. We've been having this conversation, the three of us for six years at this point. So uh, I think uh, we, uh, we are uh, set to ride this wave wherever it breaks. Uh, but, but uh, the, you know, I applaud Facebook for their, uh, Ray-Ban stories, I think they'll make no money from it, but, uh, you know, because smart glasses that are just audio smart glasses are not blowing the barn doors off, neither Echo frames nor uh, Bose frames are, are doing particularly well. Um, so I think 
think there's got to be a lot more functionality built into it. I do think influencers might use them uh, to create more content, and that that could be uh, an interesting use case for it if if it indeed evolves. But as as the three of us who follow the trajectory of things and not the moment in time of things, this is part of that trajectory, and it's an and it's an important part of that trajectory. Yeah, so I mean they they need to be in the business, so when the technology arrives, they don't have to start from from zero. Absolutely. All right, everybody, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for joining. Thanks, guys.